I suppose it's about time I told this story. I'm not getting any younger and I think it's a story that needs to be passed on, considering the state of the world. This was in my early days at the DNR, that's the Department of Natural Resources of course, in a unit jokingly called the Night Stalker Unit. It was our job to deal with the cases deemed CZEE, that's classified zoological entities. Anything found in the natural world that requires special care and diplomatic contingencies. Dogmen, Sasquatch, Merfolk, any of those entities which defy scientific conventions, display an intelligence similar to our own, or present a formidable threat to our species which requires a high level of discretion and tact on our part. If someone has an encounter with a CZE, that's not something we look into, other than to make sure they haven't gathered any evidence that might compromise the CZE's privacy. What concerns us are the cases of negative contact. If a company is attempting to develop an area which is causing distress to the local CZE population, if one or more hunters have been attempting to catch or kill a CZE, if a family or town has been targeted by one or more CZEs in a dangerous way, or, as was the case I will describe here, someone turned up dead in an apparent attack by a CZE. This case happened in 83, back when I was still a greenhorn working under Connor Duncliffe, my mentor and a legend in the parks and wildlife crowd. We were called out to a park area known as the land between the lakes, over by Kentucky and Tennessee. This was a fairly popular area for hunting, hiking and camping. It was before the big summer rush that a family had parked their RV in the campground located in the northern part of the area to begin what would have been a perfect family summer camping trip. What they got instead was a nightmare beyond anything they thought was possible. The report came to us about eight hours after a local had found the family dead. By then, the local police and park rangers had gone over the whole terrible scene. The family had been butchered, ripped to shreds by either a wild animal or an axe murderer they didn't know, which is how it ended up on our desk. Connor and I went to the scene and tried to smooth things over with the locals, get them busy with crowd control and patrolling. Anything to minimize the trauma they would experience having to process a scene like this. The campsite looked like the killing floor of a slaughterhouse. The father was laying just outside the door of the camper, split down the middle. The shotgun at his side had only been fired once and based on the evidence hadn't managed to hit anything but dirt. Inside the camper, the little boy was in pieces all around the main living area. He couldn't have been a day over 11. Further in the back we found the mother, in the bathroom at the rear of the camper. The door to the bathroom had been torn off the hinges and crushed like a tin can. We found defensive wounds on her, so she had tried to put up a fight at least. Connor was the one who noticed there were clothes and dolls for a young girl in the camper as well. We searched the area, hoping and praying that she got away and hid somewhere. We found her not 40 yards away, 20 feet up in a pine tree, torn apart and stuck there on a branch the way shrikes will stick bugs on a black thorn. I had never seen something so terrible before. Connor looked like he was about to faint or lose his lunch. I'd never seen him so mad. After we had both gathered ourselves, we started in on the case. All evidence pointed to a dogman attack, what we call the black dog case at the DNR. The father had been drawn out, most likely by a noise or a tap on the camper. Once he was dispatched the mother and children barricaded themselves in the bathroom and the CZE tore the door off killed the mother and proceeded to drag the children out to be slaughtered. Connor was convinced there had been more than one, which meant this wasn't a rouge loner and meant this was a serious threat to the people in the area. Something had to be done and I had no idea what that might mean. After we made sure the teams had everything under control, we went back to the motel we had rented in the area. I remember Connor spending most of the night on the terrace outside smoking like a chimney and looking like he was considering something truly unpleasant. The next morning, I couldn't be sure he had ever managed to sleep but he looked at me hard and told me there was a way this could be fixed if I had the courage and was sure I wanted it fixed. I told him I'd do anything to make things right for that family and he nodded with a condemned expression. 
He told me to go and fetch supplies for a camping trip, for at least three or four days. We had tents and lights and things like that in the truck, so I got food and water and other necessities. When I got back I saw he had a bag of evidence taken from the scene. When I started to ask about it he just nodded and checked the supplies. We drove further north into Kentucky, deep into the country where the road turned to gravel and gravel to dirt. We seemed to be following an old logging road. When we came to a fence marked protected land we left the truck and hiked deeper into the woods for most of the day. On the way I noticed Connor picking prairie sage by the handful and stowing it in a bag. We had brought a bow and a few arrows and Connor told me to keep an eye out for any game we could bring down. I spotted a decent sized jack rabbit and we managed to bag it, even though I wasn't much of a bow hunter. It was nearly night when we reached a spot flat and open enough to set up on. Once camp was set up and he got a fire going, he tossed in a handful of the sage he'd collected. The green leaves created an acrid heavy smoke that permeated the area. It reminded me of my grandmother, who used to burn sage around her house all the time. I asked him if I should clean up the rabbit to make us some food but he said the rabbit wasn't for us. I had been running through different explanations for what we were out there to do but nothing made enough sense so I finally had to ask. Connor looked up at the red-orange fading light and drew in a deep breath. What we're here to do, he said, is something we do not do lightly. I haven't done it in going on 20 years now, and I don't suppose I'll ever need to do it again. It was taught to me by my grandfather and his grandfather before him, and before him the Indians who were either taught by their grandfathers or came up with it on their own. You know that the creatures who were responsible for that horror back at the park, They've been around longer than any of us, before the settlers, before the Indians. Our relationship with them has changed throughout our shared history. Sometimes they would have the upper hand and we'd live in fear of the woods, or we'd have the upper hand and they'd be forced back deeper to keep away from our guns and machines. As you know, they are highly intelligent, on a different level than we are I suppose. I believe they were a sort of evolutionary crossroad where the human race split between the thinking society and the primal tribes. They evolved along a different path, a more natural path you might say. They may not be able to speak our language or build cities like we can, but they are just as sharp, just as observant and adaptive as we are, perhaps even more so, seeing as how they don't have language or histories cluttering up their thinking. The point is, they are not animals in the way wolves or bears are to us. Evolutionarily speaking they are on the same level as we are and because of this we have to consider our relationship with them diplomatically. We don't want to live in fear of them, and they want to be left alone. To maintain this peace, the ancient humans had devised a line of contact between us, in the event of some unacceptable event. A way of reaching out and making peaceful contact. Obviously, this is not something either side enjoys in any sense. The dogmen have cultivated a powerful distrust of humans over the centuries, and I can't say I blame them for that. They respect us as a threat, but they despise us as a species. This of course is not true of all of them. Like us, there are some among them more prone to peace and coexistence just as there are others who would wipe us out given the chance. That is why this contact is extremely risky for us. I remember feeling distant, like what he was saying was bouncing around in my head and I couldn't get a hold of it. Was he seriously telling me we were about to meet with one of the dogmen? A whole pack of them even? For what? To talk to them? Ask for their help? I just sat like a statue as he talked and threw more sage on the fire. The ritual, which is what my granddaddy called it, was to be followed to the letter. The meeting place is deeper into the woods and we were to bring no tools or weapons or even clothes. Nothing but the offering and the evidence. This would put us completely at their mercy, which is the only way they would let us get close. That was the first thing to land in my mind. No weapons? No clothes? I thought he might be trying to kid me but when I looked at his face I could see he wasn't just serious, he was scared. To see a man like Connor in terror was something I'll never forget. He tossed another clutch of sage on the fire and gestured to it. The sage burning, he said, 
was part of the ritual. The Indians believed it would ward off evil spirits in the area. My granddaddy had a different idea what it was. He called it an olfactory beacon of sorts. A strong smell to get their attention and one they associate with the contact ritual, letting them know we would be attempting contact. He lifted a branch of the sage to his nose before tossing it into the fire. We waited until the moon was high and the path was lit enough for us to walk in the dark. I was staring up at the moon through my tent wall when Connor called to me and said it was time. I felt my stomach do a gymnastics routine and crawled out to see the fire was out and Connor was already completely bare. I took off my clothes numbly and went to join him. I'd never felt so vulnerable as I did standing in that dark wood, naked and shivering. It wasn't cold but I imagine I could have been mistaken for a eunuch I was so nervous. I grabbed the rabbit we'd killed and sort of clutched it to my chest, trying to feel less naked. Before we set out, Connor grabbed a handful of the ashes from the fire and held it out, blowing a puff of soot over me before tossing the rest on himself. We walked and we walked. It seemed like we had walked until I was sure the sun would be coming up. Up until now the forest had been wet with sound. Birds in the trees, bugs chirping and whirring. The whole orchestra of nature. But at some point everything went quiet as a church hall. It was like someone found the volume knob on the woods and turned it off. I hesitated for a moment until I remembered Connor's instructions. Walk steady and calm, keep your eyes on the path, pay no mind to anything you might see or hear, and most importantly you are not to look at anything if it should look at you. As we walked the only sounds were the wind in the trees and the crunch of leaves beneath us. Until I started to hear something moving in the woods to our left. Something big. I kept my eyes forward as the sound trailed us, matching our pace. Then came a sound to our right, a deep, low, guttural, growl that made everything inside you shudder and clench. I had heard the researchers mention infrasound, a sort of low-frequency sound that can cause anxiety and feelings of dread in people. They said it could be detected in a tiger's roar and that our reaction to it might be tied to our ancestral fears. Maybe it wasn't tigers they were worried about after all. Either way, being there in the dark, with nothing between them and us, I can't begin to describe the terror I felt. As we walked, the two at our sides kept abreast of us. One of them jumped onto the path behind us and let out another growl that made my teeth vibrate before charging us. I could hear the crash of the leaves, feel the thuds of its feet hitting the dirt not two feet behind me. It took everything within me not to spin around and bolt for the wood line, screaming and pissing myself. I heard it slide to a stop and felt the dirt and sticks it kicked up bounce off my calves but I just kept walking and Connor did the same. I couldn't feel my body anymore but I just focused all my sanity on walking and looking straight ahead. When Connor finally stopped, we had come to a clearing. The grass and prairie sage was a bright silver in the moonlight which was so strong it looked to be daytime. For a moment we just stood, the forest was still and silent as a graveyard. Then I caught a glimpse of eyes reflecting the moonlight in the bushes ahead of us. A large shape emerged from the forest in front of us. It crawled forward on all fours, its black fur seeming to absorb all light. A living silhouette with two glowing pearls where its eyes should be. Two others emerged alongside it like bodyguards, one of them looked like spun silver in the moonlight and its eyes held a spark like amber when you rub it against wool. The other had patches of black and eyes that glowed like the dying cinders of an old bonfire. I almost broke my composure when I felt hot breath on the back of my legs and heard a snuffling. I twitched involuntarily and the thing let out another low warning growl before touching its cold nose to my backside as it sniffed and circled me. Another black shape was circling Connor as well and I couldn't see his face but something about his calm demeanor settled the thundering in my ears. The dogman circling me growled again and tried to look up into my eyes and I looked away quickly, dodging its stare like a nervous kid being confronted by an angry policeman. It lunged at me and I heard the snap of its teeth and felt the rush of air as it bit the air in front of my crotch, sending in shudder through me that made me glad I had emptied my bladder before leaving. 
The large black dog man at us for a moment before shifting. Something inside it popped like a twig being snapped in a wet towel and it slowly rose onto two legs. The other two followed suit. The two at its sides had to be seven or eight feet tall, but the black one had to be closer to ten feet. I had never seen something so massive so close before. It almost blacked out the moon over us. Connor looked at me and made a gesture to the rabbit I held. I felt like I was in a slow motion terror dream and my body wouldn't respond. A low growl behind me snapped me out of it and I stepped forward. I could feel the eyes on me like hot pokers held inches from my skin, waiting for an excuse to close the gap. I laid the rabbit at the feet of the largest, stepping into its shadow that seemed to be an extension of itself, as though I might be stepping into a vast open mouth. A snort came from high above me and I felt a snuffling at my hair. To my absolute horror a nose entered my field of vision, then a muzzle, then the bright bioluminescent pearls of its eyes. Something left me in that moment, like it had reached into me and taken something, what it was I couldn't be sure. I looked away from those points of light in the black mass before me with great difficulty. Then I stepped back, carefully moving to Connor's side once again. The largest sniffed at the rabbit before making a gesture to one of the attendants, who grabbed the hair in one hand. It looked like a gorilla holding a kitten, even though I thought the rabbit had been quite large for its species. It disappeared into the woods and Connor took the bag of evidence from under his arm. He began to pull objects out and laid them on the ground before him. There was a pace of bloodied cloth, a wedding band stained black with blood, a child's shoe, and finally a lock of golden hair. The alpha sniffed at the items intently, growling low as it got to the hair. It stood at its full height and watched Connor as he pulled the last items from the bag. A clutch of fur found in the father's hand, saliva samples taken from the bodies, and small vial of urine-soaked dirt taken near the site. The Alpha sniffed at these items and snorted before grunting and standing. It growled deeply for a moment before turning to disappear into the dark with a brief step, covering the distance to the trees like a cloud passing in front of the moon. The others soon followed, looking back at us with low warning growls. After they had gone, Connor and I just stood in shock until the sounds of the forest returned as quickly as they had gone. A great weight seemed to lift off me and I felt like I might pass out. Connor took a long breath in and let it out slow, shaking just the smallest bit. He looked at me and grinned. I think she likes you, he said and I almost fell over at that, my knees buckling slightly. The trip back to the camp seemed to happen in double time, like someone rewinding a tape. Once we found the lawn turns, Connor and I pulled on our clothes and climbed into our tents without a word. I felt like I might never sleep again, my heart still thudding in my ears, but I ended up falling asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. The next few days were spent camping and waiting. Connor had told me we had to stay in the area until we had gotten some indication that they had done something about our mutual problem. He told me about his first time performing the ritual of contact. It hadn't been here, though he said he had contacted this pack before. This was apparently something done all over the country. The ritual changes slightly in certain areas but the purpose was the same. On the third night we heard far off howling, deep and piercing even at a distance. It sounded the way a coyote pack will sing in chorus, all baying and howling and yipping at different volumes and intervals. The next morning we found, laid on the ground before our campfire, three massive clawed hands severed at the wrist and lined up. Connor smiled when he saw it. Looks like they took care of it, he'd said, lifting one to examine it. He handed one to me and it felt heavier than it looked, like holding a gun for the first time. The one hand was bigger than both my hands together and the long claws at the end of each finger had to be five inches and retracted slightly. The fur on each was a different color and each one was clearly a left hand. Connor dropped each into a separate bag and said the lab boys would be over the moon about these. They tended to collect their dead fairly religiously so remains are difficult to come by. And then we packed up and went. 
We hadn't heard of any further activity in the area and we told everyone we were authorized to tell that the situation was resolved and we had performed a highly successful contact. After that I felt a bit like a celebrity at the DNR. It was something I'll never forget and something I wouldn't considering doing again unless the situation was dire. Although, with the reports we've been getting lately, it might be something we won't be able to do at all anymore very soon. We don't know why they've been becoming more active and aggressive lately but it certainly makes the continued peace between us more and more unreliable. What that means for the future, I can only fear the worst. Dog man or werewolf encounter. This one's a doozy and still bothers me to this day. I was in high school at the time and it was around 1 am on a Saturday night. Me and my best bud were just hanging playing some league at the crib when we got a call that our friend got too drunk at a party and needed to be picked up. Whatever, we're sober as penguins and he's gotten us before so we set out. We pick him up and throw him in he backseat and begin the journey home. We live kinda out in the country so it's a bit foggy and no other cars on the road. When all of a sudden as we come around a turn, we see this, animal, thing. A ball of reddish brown fur just hunched over in the ditch on the side of the road. I thought it was maybe an injured bear or a big ass wolf so I slow down to a creep and blast the high beams. This mother f proceeds to turn its head and look right at us. Beady little red eyes, pointed ears, and a snout like a wolf. I can't look away from this thing as our drunken friend is rolling around in the back completely unaware. This thing then stands up on two legs and turns to face us. Looks like a dead ass werewolf slash vampire mix. Fangs poking out of its mouth. Long pointed ears. Covered in long reddish brown fur that's thinner on its chest and midsection. It's taller than the street sign next to it and it's still in the ditch. Easily 8 to 9 feet tall. It's lanky as hell but still can see some muscle definition. And it's just staring at us. I glance over at my buddy in the passenger seat and he's sunken way down shaking just saying drive drive, drive. Dude please just drive. Jake please. Drive. I turn my head back to decide if I'm gonna have to run this thing over. This thing fuggin gets down on all fours and bounds across the field next to it at a breakneck pace. And I just sit there stunned. Snap out of it and drive home. Questioning if I go on to be one of those crazy Bigfoot people and spend my life hunting this thing. Nobody ever believes me when I tell the story but I can still call my buddy up and ask WTF did we see that night dude and he immediately knows what I'm talking about. So yeah. And now I spend 90% of my time in forests and outdoors for my job. Always knowing that stuff like that really do be out here. Another extraordinary story of transformation was told by a young man who lived in Langrick Fen, not far from Dog Dyke. He was an ardent archaeologist and one day while digging in the peat discovered some ancient remains. Among them was what looked like a human skeleton with a wolf's head. Carrying the object into his cottage he placed it on a table and examined it carefully. But he could make nothing of it and concluded that it must have been some monstrosity, such as showmen bring out at fairs to excite the interest of the crowd. That night, however, he found himself unable to sleep, and fancying he heard a noise in the back premises, got up to investigate. Suddenly he heard a sharp rat-tat on the window pane and looking round perceived a dark object looking at him. This speedily resolved itself into the form of a human being with a wolf's head. Every feature was distinctly marked and there was no possibility of reflection, since no light was visible anywhere. As the young man stood transfixed with horror, the creature gave a snarl of savage exultation and raised its arm to dash in the glass whereupon he recovered the power of movement and fled into the kitchen. A crash sounded behind him and he wasted no time in locking and barring the door and erecting a barricade of furniture against it. There he waited all night in a cold sweat, while the stealthy pad-pad of feet sounded without. 
At last the first streaks of dawn told him that his long vigil was over and as the light grew stronger he ventured to unbar and open the door. Nothing was visible of the ghostly visitor, but the table, whereon he had placed the skeleton was overturned and the window of the room was shivered into fragments. Hastily collecting the remains of the uncanny being, which lay scattered all over the floor, he buried them again in the same place, where he had found them and covered them over with several layers of peat. Nor was he again disturbed, though for many years afterwards, he would describe with vivid gesture his peculiar adventure with the supernatural. Note, zoologist, biologist Roger Parsons commented, the story was recorded in 1926, and even today it sends a shiver down my spine. Reading this short tale, I wondered if other Lincolnshire places were said to have been home to such creatures. It was in an archaeological dig that the bones of the creature were found and a chapter of events set in motion. Without giving anything away, I would advise my archaeologist colleagues to avoid bringing unidentified bones into the house and leaving them on the kitchen table. Werewolf, dog man, encounter or just a coyote? Need to know if anyone has experienced something like this. In March 2015, I woke up at around 3 a.m. I have no idea why, usually I wake up to drink water or use the bathroom, but I needed neither of those. Anyway, I was living in Southern California at the time near Camp Pendleton and where I lived there was my neighborhood then just wilderness. There was nothing beyond my neighborhood for miles, just land. Just an FYI, I have always been into the supernatural, but I don't think I really believed it until this experience. Before I went to sleep I opened my window because it was hot and I had my curtains open and my shades open and pulled up to make sure air was getting in. So, at 3 am I woke up and just looked out my window which was next to my bed and I thought I saw someone standing at the crosswalk across the street. I was just thinking that's so weird because usually we didn't have runners or early morning walkers until about 4.45 am. So I got up and went to my window so I could get a closer look and what I saw I will never forget. This thing was standing, but its legs were bent and it had some white fur covering the body, however I could still see some skin. Its back was hunched over and its face looked like some sort of dogs. If this creature was standing straight up, I'd say that it would be about 7 or 8 feet tall. Now mind you this was at 3 am so I was just like wow okay you're hallucinating go back to sleep. However, I was literally paralyzed and could not take my eyes off this creature. Its nose and ears just look so similar to a dog's or some sort of wolf or coyote. Where I lived, coyotes were very prevalent, however they never really came into the neighborhood. So. As you can tell I was just completely shocked and nervous and as I was about to shut my window the thing turned its head and stared right at me. It was standing directly under a streetlight so I could see its features very clearly and its eyes were so black, but somehow they were shining to where you could really see them staring right into your soul. That did it for me, I slammed my window shut, pulled down the blinds, closed the curtains, and jumped right into bed while pulling the covers over my face. I never went back to sleep that night. Flash forward two years later, in June of 2017, I again woke up, but this time I was just hungry. So I went downstairs to get some food and sat at my kitchen table. In the chair that I sat, my back was facing the window on the side of the house. This window was about a foot off the ground and it was open about 10 inches because my mom forgot to shut it. Now. That window had no screen because it got torn somehow and we just didn't get around to replacing it yet. Anyway, I had my earbuds in and was watching a movie or show, I can't exactly remember, but I heard a noise. I couldn't tell if it was from the movie or from outside so I paused it and listened. I then heard heavy breathing, but I have never heard this kind of breathing before and it was coming from directly behind me, right outside the window. The breathing was rough, rigid and sounded not anything like a human. I was too scared to turn around, but the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up and I had goosebumps everywhere. The breathing lasted for about two minutes then I heard heavy footsteps, as if this thing was walking away. 
After about 10 minutes have passed, I shut the window, locked it, closed the curtains, and ran up to my room. I told my parents about my first encounter the next day after it had happened, I was 16 at the time and still living with them. They just kind of looked at me and laughed and said I was seeing things and that it was probably just a coyote. After my second encounter, I told them the next day and that time they really thought I was just tired and was hearing things. My question to everyone out there is, have any of you experienced something similar to this? Was this just a coyote or do you guys think that I was hallucinating? It's been bothering me for a while now and I had to download this app to get my story out there because I cannot deal with no answers. Pretty sure I saw a werewolf. So, I never believed in the supernatural, until I was like 18 and me and my friends played with a Ouija board, story for another time. Anyways, after the ensuing craziness from that escapade, I'm a full-on believer. Not believer, thank God. On with the actual sighting. I live in a very rural part of Mississippi. Like, I believe my town has something like 247 people in it. Everybody knows everybody. Weird things have happened before, like animals being slaughtered or going missing, that sort of thing. Naturally we chalked it up to coyotes or other critters. I'm an avid hunter, so I was heading out to the woods with my bow, a fully decked out Matthew's Creed. I got out a little earlier than usual, so it was still pretty dark. I've never minded the woods before, so all I planned on doing was relaxing in my stand for a while as I didn't feel like stalking today. It's not too far away from daylight, so the birds and other wildlife are starting to make their morning calls. Usually pretty peaceful, right? I swear to God, in the span of a second, everything in that patch of wood shut up at the same exact time. Dead silence. It didn't even try to be subtle, that alone scared the piss out of me. So naturally my scared self froze, and just listened for anything. My first thought was, oh, something's out here with me, which freaked me out even more. Then I started to think maybe it was just a bear or a bobcat, which I still was terrified to meet up with, but at least it gave me a logical answer. I figured I could hear a bear coming, but I knew big cats were renowned for stalking people without their knowing, which scared the daylight out of me. I decided to keep moving towards my stand, post up, and just point my bow down the tree. After what seemed like forever, I freaking made it. I shuffled up the stand, pulled out my knife just in case, and just listened. Dawn was definitely breaking now, which made me feel better. Still no sounds of wildlife, which was getting more and more eerie. Now, my stand is perched on the side of a creek. The creek wasn't very deep, like maybe to the top of your ankle. About the only sound I could hear was the slight noise of the running water. Then I hear something to my right, and it is running fast. I instantly raise my bow and wait, crapping my pants. It's getting louder and louder, closer as well. I almost screamed when I saw this bastard. It literally looked like something out of dog soldiers, only more muscular. This thing busted through the brush, ran down the slope and through the creek, then disappeared on the other side. I have seen some stuff, let me tell you, but I was shaking like a newborn babe. I didn't ease off my drawstring for like 10 minutes, which is a long time to hold a bow, FYI. I mean, this thing was huge. Like, 6 feet 5 inches 7 apostrophe 5, 250 pounds of no. And I've seen bears and the like before, they do not run like that. Anyways, after that, the sun really started to show and the birds started chirping. I had calmed myself down, so I noped out of there in a hurry. While I was terrified at the time, it's definitely gonna one of my coolest memories to look back on. I'm just gonna move my stand and hunt elsewhere. My encounter was in Sept of 2018. I live on the edge of the Sam Houston National Forest. A 5 to 10 minutes walk from Lake Conroe down FM 1097. 
Strange things had been happening for about a month with things coming to my house, weird noises in the woods behind my house. My wife and I had a dog that was taken by something which I saw something grab my dog and yank it into the tree line. Unfortunately I couldn't see what grabbed her. But when my wife and I went to find her in the place where she disappeared, there were no signs of a struggle, no blood, no fur, nothing. Like whatever took my dog just vanished. To shorten my story it was about 4 am one morning I was sitting on my porch smoking a cigarette enjoying the peace and quiet. But at this time it was to quiet, absolutely no noises. And in this forest even for 4 am there are always noises. I shined my spotlight around from the backside of my property and followed the tree line. I came to the biggest tree directly across from my front porch and next to the tree was the biggest wolf head I have ever seen looking at me from behind the tree. This head had to be about 4 to 4 twelfths feet off the ground. This thing had the brightest green eyes I have ever seen. Captivating actually. I just stared, slightly shaking with the light in hand. After a few seconds this thing grabbed the tree with its hand, not paw, but hand and stood up next to the tree. I was floored. What in the hell am I looking at? I was in shock and completely scared. This creature was gray and was standing there just looking at me. I couldn't move. I was shaking terribly. This thing then took two steps towards me and that snapped me out of my trance and I reached behind me trying to find my doorknob. I ran inside and woke up my wife and begged her to come outside and see this. Surprisingly instead of yelling at me for waking her she said she could tell something was wrong with me by the sound of my voice. She came to the front door and I just knew this thing would be gone but it wasn't. There it stood and the look on my wife's face said it all. She was seeing what I was seeing. The creature then dropped to all fours and walked down the tree line back into the forest. I've never been the same since. It left me scarred where I'm afraid of the woods at night and very jumpy to noises and things. It looked like a giant gray werewolf which I now know is probably what is referred to as a dogman. People need to know that these things are out there. I'm not saying people should go out there and obliterate them all if they could even find them but people should be aware that they exist and they're out there. But believe me, I've tried telling others and they just laugh and make jokes and think I'm nuts which makes the people who have encounters shut down and not share their experience. Anyways that's it in a short nutshell. If you read all this, thank you for taking the time. Take care and be safe out there. Dog Man Sighting in Kerville, Texas Back around 20 years ago, I was visiting my great uncle in the region around Kerrville, Texas. At the time he was living in his first house in the area before he moved to a retirement community, near a small set of trees. The trees were beautiful, really, as is the hill country. I was staying with him and my great aunt for about a week when we went out for an evening to walk his dachshund as we tended to do in evenings in general. The walk was uneventful as the sun set, just a normal evening complete with the calls of doves and other wildlife, and the dog just having a wonderful time. Then, suddenly, all the wildlife went deafeningly silent and both of us froze, as did the dog. I remember having a distinct sense of unease and fear that I could not quite explain, and the dog looking directly in a specific area near a streetlight, my eyes turning to where the dog was looking. There was a creature loping through there, a dog-like thing about the size of a large Labrador Dachshund hybrid, save that on the creature's neck there was a head the size of a bear, and the thing was loping up and down and up and down in a way that fitted that kind of, build. It looked hypnotic in a sense and I was more terrified than I have ever been with anything else I ever saw. It gave me a visceral understanding of Lovecraft's idea that things that just look fundamentally wrong are terrifying precisely because the proportions do not fit. That thing was powerfully built, too, the upper limbs, in particular, were very stout, and the dog remained frozen for another few minutes before we moved back to the house. I'm not sure what precisely that was, or if it was a dog man, but it convinced me that something like that could exist. The sudden silence that lasted for a few minutes after it left, 
and the dog just being frozen without even growling or barking still sends chills in me when I remember it. As my only encounter with something like a cryptid, too, it remains something very vivid in my mind, not least because I know how dogs move, I know what wolves would move like, and whatever that was it was no natural thing that made sense. The head was so massive that it dragged the body down with it when it moved. It had a very fluid aspect to the motion at the same time, and that dissonance is what made it hypnotic. Also not an easy thing to forget because it just looked. Wrong. Head goes down, back limbs go up. Head goes up, upper body goes up with it. All in this fluid motion. To be as specific as I can get. Disembodied voice in the woods. Here's a weird one that happened to me. I'm not super onto cryptids but I've experienced enough strange stuff in the woods to make me think twice. I posted this on the missing 411 subreddit and people were saying this is classic dogman behavior. I don't know what was behind these experiences, but they are very real. A half hour from my house in the state forest there are backpacking shelters you can rent. It's like a single group campsite with a crude cabin with no door, a fire ring, and a single pit toilet outhouse. They are in the middle of nowhere, several miles apart. Not like a campground at all. Very secluded. There are five sites on a 32 mile trail. About 15 to 20 years ago, my parents' friends were staying out there partying for a few days. My mom, dad, dog and I hiked out there for a day trip to visit. I was a kid, maybe 12 or so. I was hiking the trails around the campsite with my dog. I heard a very distinct cry for help a single help me. Loud. Plain as day. It echoed off the hill. It was real. It was a soft tone higher pitched voice, either a woman or an older child. I didn't hesitate, I started running towards the voice with my dog bad idea, should have grabbed an adult. We were cresting a hill and this voice was so loud that I anticipated seeing this person in need of help as soon as we got to the top of the hill and looked down. My dog was starting acting weird as we frantically searched for almost a half hour and came up empty. Nothing. Nobody out there. She seemed reluctant to continue further and we turned around. This was a large border collie, husky mix. She was really intelligent and protective of me as a child. She started to lag behind me rather than lead on the leash. I was starting to have to coax her forward a little by tugging on the lead. I told my parents and the other adults at the camp. They just kinda laughed it off. I was distraught the rest of the day. I will add that the adults were the better part of a mile away and this noise was coming from the opposite direction of camp. Fast forward a couple decades later to last year. I'm solo backpacking, which I do a lot. I decided to rent that very same spot for myself. It was my halfway destination and place to sleep on a 15 mile round trip. Things are going good. I made camp and fired up the single burner stove. It was dark, almost time for bed, enjoying my delicious sodium laden ramen noodles. This uneasy feeling abruptly came over me. A feeling I've never really had before and can't fully describe. My body tensed up, I got cold. My hair stood up on the back of my neck. Right then and there I suddenly needed to leave. I'd gwai, just had to. I did not have time to properly pack. I half-ass started stuffing my gear back into my pack. Then my lead headlamp with relatively fresh, or so I thought, batteries died. There's absolutely no moon. It's dark. Very dark. I pulled a tiny 50 lumen streamlight style pen light from my pocket and finished packing. I had a large heavy duty contractor garbage bag that I always keep packed away to use for a makeshift rain poncho or WE. I finished stuffing my tent and sleeping bag in the garbage bag. I hustled out of the woods with my poorly organized pack on my back and my garbage bag of belongings over my shoulder. The strange thing about my story was it wasn't quiet in the woods when things got weird. I could hear a pack of coyotes yipping and going nuts in the distance when I was hiking out. 
but nothing else really. Here I am. A grown-ass man, who considers himself a proficient outdoorsman. Sprinting out of the woods? For what? From what? The dark? As a legal permit holder I always carry a sidearm when doing long solo trips in the woods. My hand was hovering around the holster the whole way back. I made it to my car in serious record time. I loaded up and sped off. It took me a while to shake the feeling. On the way back I did get lost, but Google Maps helped me backtrack to the fork in the trail. I completely 100% forgot about the voice calling for help incident at that very spot a decade or so earlier. Then it hit me once I got home and unpacked in the middle of the night. I remembered that voice, looking for that person screaming for help. Me and my dog. I got knots in my stomach. For reasons I can't explain. It all kinda started to make sense to me. Like there was some sort of correlation. I do not venture into that area anymore unless I'm with other people. Something strange is or was out there, or something really bad happened there in the past. I know this story isn't that crazy, but most of the real ones aren't. I looked online into missing persons or whatever and didn't come up with anything significant. There have been a couple murders but those predated my experience by 10 plus years and although we're in the same state land, they were not what I'd consider nearby. Perhaps something was attempting to lure me somewhere as a kid. That same thing was enough to tip me off as an adult. Maybe I was just a dumb kid with an active imagination. Maybe as an adult the stress of life got to me as I was left to my thoughts in the wilderness and I had a panic attack. Who knows really? Edit. This was in the Great Lakes region of North America. My ex-husband encountered something one night while smoking. Back in 2001, I was living in Georgia with my ex-husband. We were living in an apartment at the time which had a good-sized balcony. My ex-husband smoked so I would often tell him to go out on the balcony so, the apartment wouldn't smell like cigarettes. Anyway one morning, I woke up to find him lying next to me shaking like a leaf. I asked him what happened and so, he proceeded to tell me his story. He said while he was out on the balcony smoking a cigarette when he heard what he thought sounded like a horn, from a train, blaring off in the distance. He thought nothing of it and continued to smoke his cigarette. All of a sudden he could hear the dogs in the surrounding area start to bark like crazy but again he shrugged his shoulders and continued to smoke his cigarette. Then he said heard the sound again but this time closer and it actually, caused the sliding door on the balcony to vibrate. He quietly snuck back inside the apartment and just as he was closing the sliding door, he heard the sound again but this time it was right outside our front door and it sounded like something growling too. It was a while before he finally came to bed. After he finished telling me his story, I asked him what did it sounded like, he never saw the thing that made the sound, and he said the closest thing he could compare the sound to was the howling in the movie An American Werewolf in Paris. Anyway, I'd like to know if anybody else who was living in Lawrenceville, Georgia at the time encountered the same thing my ex-husband did? Two werewolves encountered along the Little Canal River. One night I was out along the road that goes past my house. We are pretty rural area here, along WV5 which parallels the Little Canal River from Elizabeth to Grantsville, but the animals here are always the same. Until the late 1990s the state DNR let coyotes loose and in the early 1980s wild turkeys. Now they are releasing wild elk. Yet there is no sightings of these creatures. I have heard black panthers and even seen two kittens dead. At my friend's house, her dad had chased and treed the kittens, but the mother got away. To this day, West Virginia DNR refuses to state that black panthers exists in WV. This night I saw something I never thought I would have seen. Two huge wolves that were bigger than anything I have seen before. I know people who own wolves and I have been around them. When they left on vacation, I even feed their pet wolves. 
so I know how big they can get, but these were no regular wolves. They were twice as big as me and they gave this eerie feeling. They walked off the hillside and came out of the foggy mist. Their eyes had this glow of yellow even before I turned my phone's flashlight on them. Yes, I had my phone in hand. Why no picture? Because I was scared. Scared stiff and was just able to look and see these two wolves with one being smaller than the other. Both were very skinny, hippie or one could say bony. Gray with black color markings around eyes and ears. Brown down their backs and gray bushy tail. Tail as long as my leg. The heads were way bigger than my own. Glowing yellow eyes looking right at me. Slowly walking past me. Both moving together and moving their heads when needed to keep me in view. Then they crossed the road and disappeared into the river bank. Across the river on the hillside were coyotes barking and yapping. That was until those two wolves crossed the river to their side. Dead quite then. No noise at all. No bugs, no birds, no coyotes. When my heart started again, I ran as fast as my legs could carry me. I posted what I saw on my Facebook page. Many said they were just northern wolves. No. No wolves here in WV. Not here, that haven't been brought here as pets. These two were no pets. I think the smallest, the one closet towards me, was a female. I also feel she protected me from the male, the biggest one. She nudged him to go on. I thank her for that. He would have killed me easily. They both could have with one bite to my throat. It's not too often I venture out further than my yard nowadays. This property has many of supernatural events happen here. But that night, I truthfully feel I saw a werewolf and his mate. I know what I saw and it scared me so bad that I have become afraid of the dark. Even on my own property that I grew up on. It has changed me in ways I can't explain. I have become more nature-minded. I worship nature and the power she holds. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. I know those creatures exist and I give them a wide path to travel. Always respected and mindful of their presence. Roma Santa, the werewolf of Spain. It happened in the 19th century, this wretched case soon became a headache for the local police. For the investigators, capturing this psychopath exceeded their expectations. Not only did this man display intelligence far superior to average assassins, but he also did so in a grotesque and ruthless manner. During the 16 years it took the police to capture him, he had women and children as his preference. In total, there were 13 homicides which led to the conviction of Garotville, however, this was not carried out. But who was Manuel Blanco Roma Santa? He was born in the village of Reguero, Escos, Oruense, the son of Manuel Blanco and Maria Roma Santa. Curiously, at birth, he was thought to be a girl and was baptized as Manuela. His height did not exceed 137 centimeters. His fine features, coming to be considered cute. He worked as a tailor until the death of his wife in which he had no intervention. After this event and at the age of 24 years and a height of 137 centimeters tall with tender features helped him to dedicate himself to commerce and he became a street vendor in Galicia. Where it was believed that he sold an ointment based on human fat. During his travels as a salesman, he was accused of having murdered the Ponferrada sheriff. Surprisingly, he managed to escape from police custody and took refuge in a town living with the cattle. Later he reappeared and reboard a cow, Orense, and continued murdering women and children, always managing to evade the police with ease. He even left Galicia using a false passport. He was captured in Nambella, Toledo after day laborers identified the werewolf. After his capture, he was tried in a Lariz, Orense. Why was he considered a lycanthrope? In the statements given by Roma Santa he said, The first time I transformed was on the mountain of Cuso. I came across two big fierce looking wolves. Suddenly, I fell to the ground, I began to feel convulsions, 
I wallowed three times uncontrollably and within seconds I was a wolf myself. I spent five days hanging around with the other two, until I regained my body. We attacked and ate several people because we were hungry. In the so-called cause against the werewolf, six doctors and psychiatrists certified as legal sanity. After this, Romasana confessed not to have any curse, but a disease. Also, he remembered everything that had happened when he was transformed back into a human. This declaration was decisive to receive a sentence on April 6, 1853, condemning him to pay a fine of 1,000 reales per victim and to die in the vile garrote. When the execution of the sentence was about to take place, the French hypnotist Joseph Pierre Durand de Gros, better known as Mr. Phillips and convinced Queen Elizabeth II to give him a life sentence and offered to cure him. Mr. Phillips was convinced to cure Roma Santa, considering him a wretch who suffered from a kind of monomania recognized by ancient doctors as lycanthropy. The Queen agreed, and according to recent research, the werewolf did not die in the vile club, he died in a prison in Ceuta in 1863 of stomach cancer. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.